Okay, hello students. Today we are doing lesson five. And just as a reminder, this is the last lesson in science that we're gonna do for at least a week, maybe two weeks. So I need all of your science lessons turned in today, Friday, September, um, what day is it? September 4th, uh, because we switched to social studies on Tuesday. So I need your science assignments turned in. And the things that I've graded include the science safety contract, that's worth three points. If you have not turned that in signed, I need that, a picture of that turned in to me via class dojo, private messaging. Then I need lessons one and two done. Um, that, for those assignments, I'm going to the student handbook right now, the logbook, I'm sorry. For lesson one, I need you to complete the part that I'm actually going to give you your points for having is page three. I need a picture of that. It's two notices and two wonders for page three. And I need one notice and one wonder per image. There's five images on page four. Okay, that's less than one. That's worth 11 points. And again, a picture for each page, a picture of page four and a picture of page five sent to me via private message on Class Dojo. I need these done by Friday, September 4th. Okay. Then lesson two, page five. This is where you're going to draw with colored pencils your version of the Grand Canyon's features. I need at least five features of the Grand Canyon. Realizing that a feature could be on our face, it's our eyes, our nose, our mouth, ears. For some people, their hair is a feature of their face because it covers part of their face. And that's something that we think of a person as having um, when we think of their features, their hair color. Um, for some people, their glasses. That's what, I mean, I look very different without my glasses and with them. Um, person's cheeks, their chin, um, those are parts of a person's face. Those are things that let you recognize a person by their face. So those are their features. Features of the Grand Canyon. The features that you need to include are the river, the rock walls. Um, one feature that we keep talking about is layers in the rock. Um, you could include waterfall. You could include grass or bushes or some kind of foliage because we've seen little bits of green foliage in the photos that we've looked at of the Grand Canyon. Um, perhaps you want to include boulders because we've seen several pictures with large rocks at the Grand Canyon. Perhaps you want to include a cave because we've seen caves at the Grand Canyon, especially around waterfalls. Uh, we saw, see on the front cover of this very book, a geyser. So I saw on a couple students, here's a geyser, on a couple students' uh, Grand Canyon models, they included geysers. Um, I've seen on some models, uh, they put small rocks, like rubble, pebbles, in their uh, models. Um, you need at least five features in your Grand Canyon model. And it needs to be drawn with colored pencils. It doesn't have to be a great drawing, can't be abstract art. And you have to label it with the names of the features. Those of you at home on virtual format, you have parental units, you have older siblings, and you have Google. Please spell these words correctly, okay? 
down here, that's where you explain what's going on in your picture if you think I can't understand what it is. You have to label the features of your Grand Canyon. Your Grand Canyon picture has to take up this space. You have to do it in colored pencil because we're gonna go back and add features to your model as this module continues on. And we're gonna to have to be able to erase parts of your picture um, as needed to add in future features. That's a hard pairing of words. Okay, so this page is worth 10 points. Okay, um, I put on Class Dojo through the week a picture of each class's group uh, Grand Canyon model. So you can see what the groups came up with. So you're not flying blind here. You've seen what the groups have come up with. You have examples to look at. We've looked at pictures of the Grand Canyon. I don't want you to try to copy anything exactly. I want to see your version with words. You have to label the parts of your picture. It has to be in color. Your effort determines your score. Okay. So that's your lesson two score. Lesson three, page seven. Lesson four goes back to page seven also. This one, you need to, first of all, ignore this. This goes with lesson four. But you're going to use colored pencils to draw a line to show where each distinct layer of the Grand Canyon you can see. There are at least six layers that you can see in this picture. Okay, if you need more guidance, look at the lesson three Zoom pre recorded lesson that's on my Canvas page. I've left them up for you to view, they're all there. The one that says Thursday pre recorded, that's all the way to the left on my page, I believe it is, that's lesson one. The one that says Friday pre recorded, that's lesson two. The one that is Wednesday pre-recorded, that's lesson three. Uh, Thursday pre-recorded, so it'd be the second Thursday, that's lesson four. That was today. And this one is lesson five that I'm doing right now, which is going back over what I need to get your grades caught up because a lot of my kids are not caught up. And we need these grades caught up. Your overall grade depends on it, okay? So. I need six layers where you draw your line from one side to the other. Each layer needs to be marked off in a different color, colored pencil. Then you're going to label each layer, starting at the top with your top layer being that one that interfaces with the sky. That's layer A. This layer right here, this black, see how it's black there and then you have like a white layer and then another black layer that black layer that's layer b your next one down i see a real obvious layer right here this black next to that white that's layer c so you're starting at the top labeling them a then b then c then you're going to have a d layer an e layer an f layer so you're going to have at least a b c d e f with a up here and F down here at the bottom. You might even have a G layer. G is actually a subgroup of F. But A through F, I need to be able to see your layers in six different colored pencil colors. Okay? I've uploaded an example of this on Class Dojo. Okay? So there's a correct answer example on Class Dojo for each one of my classes. Okay, so you label it EVC all the way down to F or G, six different colors. That's worth six points. The next thing 
This was on Class Dojo 2 with all the answers. F through D with all these words. And C down to A with all these words. That table represents a lot of work. And the students in class today can tell you we referred back to that table over and over today. And when we come back to science in a couple of weeks, we're going to continue referring back to this table. This table is a lot of knowledge, a lot of information. It's worth a lot of points. It's worth 24 points. Okay. Um, I also need to see a picture of your child making their fossil with um, modeling clay or Play-Doh. That's going to be worth five points because that's actually a lab. Um, I like to see my students doing hands-on. And I know that's something that a lot of people have, either Play-Doh or modeling clay. And it's not particularly expensive. Um, one of our best impressions today at school was simply from a crepe myrtle leaf pressed into modeling clay. And it turned out wonderful. Then another student um, had an elephant, a plastic elephant about that big. And he made it look like it was stepping on the modeling clay. So he had a perfect set of footprints on the modeling clay. It looked great, one of the best ones. All the kids in that class were impressed. There's 14 kids in that classroom. And all the kids are impressed. They're like, that is so awesome looking. All it was was the footprints. But that's the trace fossil evidence that we discussed when we were doing this table. It was great, great example of it. So making the fossils, fossil layer, um, rock layer with fossil evidence in it, that's worth five points. Um, trying to think. I thought there was something else. It was another small grade. Uh, oh, then today, students went back to page seven. This is one that I don't know if I received any from virtual yet. They drew an arrow up and down on their page on the opposite side from where they had the letters A through F or G labeled on their layers. They drew an arrow up and down. They labeled which end had the newest layers and which end had the oldest layers. That's three points for today. Believe it or not, that's a major concept. Okay, think about it. We talked about either on the video for my virtual students or in class for my face-to-face -face students with cake layers, which one of the cake layers, if it was a six layer cake, which cake layer is oldest? And that was the bottom layer. Cake layer on top was newest. And then we talked about how that corresponds to the Grand Canyon. So which layer is the oldest? And you'd write oldest. And then which Grand Canyon layer is newest? Newest. And you write newest there. And you take a picture of this, send that picture to me in Class Dojo, private message. And that's another three points. Okay? This goes towards uh, lesson four. Okay? So that's a three point assignment, another three point assignment, safety contract, and that newest to oldest. Six point assignment. So six and six is 12, 11, 12 and 11, 23. Another 10 is 33, plus another 24 is 57. Um, so, so far we have about 57 points accrued, if I'm doing my math correctly. Tomorrow, Friday, um, which is what this is being recorded for. We have a 
couple assignments. You're going to be making a drawing and you're going to be taking a conceptual checkpoint. Now that's a couple big words that essentially means quiz. Now I'm obligated to give the quiz and I'm obligated to the quiz question. <coughs> Excuse me. My doggy's been through here. I'm allergic to my doggy, but don't tell her that because I still love her. Um, I have to give you a certain quiz question, but they don't tell me how many points it has to count for. So I only count it for five points. So it's, it's not a hard question, but because I went go over beforehand what I expect the answer to be, and I'm giving you the answer beforehand, I expect you to get it right when you take the quiz, okay? So just like my face-to-face -face kids get to hear the correct answer exactly how I want it, I'm going to discuss in this what I want to see on this, what kind of answer I expect to get back, okay? And then when you take the quiz, give me as much of that as possible, but don't give me exact words. I don't want to see my exact words given right back to me, okay? I want to hear it in your voice. Got it? Okay, so now we actually get to Friday's lesson. We need all that other stuff caught up though, so your grades can be A's. All right, so present day Grand Canyon, nowadays, not 540 million years ago, and not when John Wesley Powell went exploring it in 1869 or 71. Think about the environment of present day Grand Canyon, okay? It's a desert, right? What types of organisms do you think might survive in different areas of the Grand Canyon today and why? Imagining all that red rock and brown and yellow and orange, all those rocks. Let me show you a picture. We're about to read this book. Grand Canyon by Jason Chin. Okay. And if you happen to want to buy this book, it's a really good book. Um, it's Amazon. I think it's about $8 or so. Look at all that orange and brown. There's a little bit of greenery there, small trees, small bushes and such. That's a lot of orange and brown and yellow. It's a desert. What kind of organisms would you expect there? You can see readily there's an eagle. What else do you think would live there? What do you think would live in those rocks? What kind of adaptations do you think animals would have there? What do you think about plants at the top of the canyon versus plants at the bottom of the canyon? Do you think certain parts of the canyon get more light than others? And do you think that might affect what plants live there? Okay, so today we're gonna to learn more about what lived in the Grand Canyon as the rock layers formed. Because yesterday we put together rock layers. My students in face-to-face, -face, each student was given a rock layer to make and make fossil impressions appropriate to that rock layer. So we had an F layer, an E layer, a D layer, a C layer, a B layer, and an A layer. And then students made fossils that would appropriately fit in those layers. So B layer was an ocean layer and a relatively warm ocean layer. So they had brachiopods, rhizoans, I think, corals and mollusks. So students, put impressions of things that would live in a, in a warm ocean environment, okay? Um, C layer and A layer was dry land that had 
um, moist areas. A layer is most like the environment that we live in now. So you would have lakes and streams and rivers. Um, we put impressions of organisms, plants and animals that would fit in those environs, okay? So we're gonna learn about the Grand Canyon as the rock layers were forming. And we're gonna learn about what lives in the Grand Canyon today. And the way we're going to do that is by reading and discussing Jason Chin's Grand Canyon. We are going on an adventure through the Grand Canyon's rock layers to learn how the Grand Canyon has changed over time. I want you to think about the following question while I read this text. How did the environment of the Grand Canyon change over time? Because by now we know the Grand Canyon hasn't always been a desert. There's been times it's been covered in ocean. There's been times when it's been dry land that had moist areas. There's been times when it was dry land with lakes and rivers. And there's been a lot of time it's been covered by ocean, which is pretty crazy to think about. The Grand Canyon, a desert now, being covered by ocean. Okay? So think about this while you're listening to me read it. How did the environment of the Grand Canyon change over time? Here's a really cool map in the beginning of the book that shows you the area of the Grand Canyon. Okay? Now, this book, I'm not going to read all the pages. I'm going to read the pages that it tells me to pick up with. The basement rocks are the oldest in the canyon, as much as 1.84 billion years old. Many younger rock layers are stacked on top of them. If you hike out of the canyon, you'll pass younger and younger layers as you climb, as if walking up through time. So walking up through the layers, you're walking up through time. Okay. Starting more than a billion years ago, layers of sediment, such as sand and mud, piled on top of the basement rocks, one after another. Basement rocks. See the basement rocks at the bottom? Basement, like a basement in a house. And then a layer of sand. See it? And then you got basement rock, layer of sand, more layers of sand, more layers. And remember, they're getting heavier, so it's pressing on it. And see the sediment layers just adding on it and smashing it down. The more layers you get, the heavier it gets. Okay? Above the basement layer, you'll reach the Grand Canyon Supergroup. Here you may find ripple marks preserved in the stone. Clues like these tell us what this place is like when the rock formed. They're like windows. Let me show you the book first, okay? Here is that window they're talking about with the ripple marks. See the ripples? They go the opposite way from the rest of the rocks. There's some more ripple marks. Okay. Here's some more. Over time, the layers of sediment turned into layers of solid rock. So those layers of sediment keep on building up, just like I talked about in class. The top layer of dirt's the newest, and over time, they're getting smashed together, and they're heavy. So they're turning to rock. They're getting heavier, and they're crushing down on each other. Okay. So the layers of sediment turn into layers of solid rock, such as sandstone and mudstone. And then something started cutting through it. You see that? See something cutting in it? Much later, Grand Canyon was carved into these layers. The youngest layers are at the top and the oldest layers are at the bottom. This look familiar? These are like the layers that we made yesterday out of the modeling clay. Then 
if something were to start chiseling through the layers, you start getting a canyon. What do you think could chisel through the layers and cause that? Okay. Clues like these tell us what the place was like when the rock formed. They are like windows to the past. This is Grand Canyon, 1.2 billion years ago, when the only living things on Earth were microbes, such as algae and bacteria. Although they were too small to see, these primitive organisms filled the oceans and were some of the earliest life forms on the planet. The mud from this tidal flat eventually transformed into a layer of solid rock, and these ripple marks were preserved in the process. They are now part of the Grand Canyon Supergroup. Okay. Let's see what they're showing? So there's a little boy walking through the Grand Canyon Supergroup. See the ripple marks? Okay, that's that Grand Canyon Supergroup that we were talking about. From 1.2 billion, billion, with a B, years ago. Kind of back there a couple years. After climbing out of the inner gorge, you'll find yourself on a broad, sun-baked slope. The plants and animals here are well adapted for life with little water. Black-throated sparrows can go for long periods without taking a drink. Many creatures sleep during the heat of the day. Pocket mice forage at night and are preyed on by owls and rattlesnakes who are adapted for hunting in the dark. So the little mice go eating at nighttime and then owls and rattlesnakes come out and eat them. And all around the pages they have pictures of the animals that they're describing. Okay. These animals are living on the rock layer called the Bright Angel Shale, which formed more than 200 million Set again. More than 200 million years after the Grand Canyon supergroup, trilobite fossils in the rocks tell us at this spot. And when you hear trilobite, you should automatically know trilobites lived in the. So we went from those mud flats to ocean. Trilobites lived at the bottom of the ocean. Once lay beneath the sea. This is Grand Canyon 515 million years ago. By this time in Earth's history, many multicellular plants and animals had evolved. Soft-bodied jellyfish floated above clam-like brachiopods and tiny hyaliths, some of the first creatures on Earth with shells. Trilobites, the first animals known to have had eyes, roam the sea floor. Around them, worm-like creatures burrowed in the sediment, sediment that eventually turned into the bright angel shale. Okay, so here's lots of trilobites, the first organisms on earth to have eyeballs. Trilobites. And as there's a, something that looks like a sea lily, an early sea lily. Okay, there weren't literally people back then. That's just to get you involved in the story. Okay. Trilobites live for, um, I'm not mistaken, hundreds of millions of years, but they've been extinct for a long time too. Um, jellyfish lived when trilobites lived. Um, trilobites look a lot like a horseshoe crab in this rendition. But trilobites, since they lived so long, they also did some evolving, some changing over the years. Let me go to page 48 for the question. How did the environment change from when the Grand Canyon Supergroup formed? Remember the Grand Canyon Supergroup? Let me go back. Grand Canyon Supergroup. This is the Grand Canyon Supergroup, the mud flats, to when the Bright Angel Shale layer 
formed? How'd the environment change? What was the environment like that? And what was the environment when it was like this? What were the changes? What kind of organisms did this book say lived in the mudflats? Were they complex or were they simple? Were they anything as organized as trilobites? Did it mention anything with eyeballs way back then in the Grand Canyon Supergroup? Or did it specifically say the first organisms on Earth with eyeballs were the trilobites when the bright angel shell layer was laid down, which is this layer. Okay. Towering over the bright angel shell is a massive cliff called the red wall limestone. The red wall has many inaccessible caves that provide nesting spots for one of the rarest birds in the world, the California condor. With a nine foot wingspan and weighing as much as 23 pounds, 23 pounds for a bird is heavy. The condor is the lar largest land bird in North America. Condors are vultures, and during the Ice Age, they fed on the carcasses of mega beasts, like giant ground sloths. Since then, their population has declined. Giant ground sloths, guys, were 1,500 pounds. Uh, sloths now, 35 pounds, maybe 40 pounds. But prehistoric ground sloths, 1,500 pounds. They looked very different and they didn't hang from trees. That would be a big tree you'd have to hang from. So they were different. Okay. So vultures during the ice age fed on carcasses of mega beasts like giant ground sloths. Since then, their population, their numbers has declined due to changes in climate and human activity. And now California condors are close to extinction. Okay. The sea covered the Grand Canyon region many times in the past. As the sea level rose, layers of sediment composed of sand, mud, and shells piled up. So ocean water would come up and sand, mud, and shells would come up. Erosion would bring sediment to the sea. Sea level would rise. Sediment layers would accumulate. The sediment was compacted. In other words, it was smashed down and cemented together over time and became sedimentary rock. Different types of sediment became different kinds of rock. So here are these pictures on the bottom. Okay. This book is full of so much information. Okay. Above the red wall cliff is a slope of rust red rock. The climate here is not as hot and dry as below, and pinyon pines and Utah junipers are common. Many creatures such as squirrels, chipmunks, and wood rats eat their seeds. These small rodents are preyed on, in other words, eaten, by gopher snakes and coyotes. At the top of the slope is a rock layer called the Hermit Foundation. Fossils in the Hermit tell us that long ago, this spot was home to, um, and looking at the pictures all around, it shows the animals and the plants that live around this level. The hermit level, um, we learned, 
Let me go back to my book. Uh, let's see. We saw this in class today, so it's very familiar. I just cannot remember right offhand what layer hermit is. So the Grand Canyon Supergroup, the mud flats, that was layer F. Bright Angel Shale is layer E. The red wall limestone that was mentioned a couple pages back, that was layer D. The Hermit Foundation the formation that we're talking about right now is layer C. Okay, so right now we're talking about layer C. Okay. Pinion jays, which is kind of bird, feeds, feast on pine nuts, but they don't eat them all. They bury some and let them grow. The trees feed the jays, and the jays plant new trees. Together, they help sustain the pinion juniper ecosystem. So the birds and the trees help each other. Okay. All this is in the bottom part of the book. This is one of those books, like a Jan Brett book, that has so much information on it. So here's a little window right here. This shows us a fossil. Of one of those giant winged insects. Look what insect it was showing us. One of those giant dragonflies. The dragonflies was a one meter wingspan. Our dragonflies now have up to a three inch wingspan, but dragonflies used to have a 36, 40 inch wingspan. So they used to be 10 times bigger than they are now. Can you imagine a dragonfly being almost as big as a person? If those things stung, that would probably hurt a lot. All right, so at the hermit crab, I'm sorry, at the hermit uh, foundation level, which is level C, there were huge dragonflies with eight inch wingspans. We actually read about some in class with 40 inch wingspans. This is Grand Canyon 280 million years ago. By this time, life was flourishing on land and trees. Ferns, fish, amphibians, and reptiles had evolved. The sea had retreated from the region, and rivers flowed across the landscape. Landscape. Seed ferns and conifers grew along their banks, and amphibians left their tracks in the mud. Mud that eventually transformed into the Hermit Foundation. How did the environment change from the Bright Angel Shell layer, which was here, the environment there, to Hermit Foundation here? How's the environment different? What kind of environment is that? What kind of environment is this? And keep in your mind, we know what the environment was all because of fossil evidence. It's not the kind of rock that we're looking at that tells us what the environment was. It's the kinds of fossils that are in that rock that tell us what the environment was. Above the red slopes of the Hermit are pale 350 foot cliffs. Big horn sheep easily navigate. their narrow ledges with specially adapted hooves. In the fall mating season, males compete for dominance by smashing into each other with their battering ram horns. These cliffs have been carved from the Coconino sandstone. Fossil footprints in the sandstone tell us that on this spot, 
250 million years ago. There's the book, first of all. And here are the fossil footprints right here. Okay, you see them? Okay, and here's this on the bottom I'm about to read to you. So over here it says, as Grand Canyon's rock layers were deposited, the remains of plants and animals were buried and some became fossils. And it's very, very few become fossils. Um, out of a hundred things that die, maybe one or two become a fossil. Most of them just decompose and disappear. A trilobite dies, sediment accumulates, shell becomes fossil as sediment becomes rock. Erosion eventually exposes fossil. Fossils are the remains or traces of ancient life that has been preserved in rock. Most fossils are found in sedimentary rock. Fossil footprints and worm burrows are called trace fossils. We talked about this in class yesterday, and I think some of my online friends might have heard the conversation that not always do we see the actual plant or animal body, but we see where the plant or animal had been, like we see footprints. So it's not the actual animal, but we know where he was because the footprints are there. Or we see the tunnel that the worm crawled through. That's called a worm burrow. So you can't see the worm's body because it completely disintegrated. It's all soft body. It doesn't have any bones. But you know where he went because you see his tunnel. Fossil skeletons and shells are called body fossils. So here's that. That didn't work. Here's that bit. Okay. And here's this fossil window we're about to look in. On this spot, 275 million years ago, an early reptile walked across huge windswept dunes. Okay. There's an early reptile walking across huge sand dunes. With little water, life here would have been difficult. My book is falling apart. But the desert wasn't entirely barren. Among the other species that called at home were scorpions, millipedes, and spiders. As the desert wind whipped across the windscape, sand piled up in thin layers. Today, those layers are preserved in the Coconino sandstone as thin, angled surfaces called crossbeds. So the Coconino is also, let me see which layer. Coconino is also part of C layer, okay? So Coconino is obviously a very dry layer. As you approach the rim of the canyon, the climate becomes cooler and more moist. Vegetation on the sloping Toro Weep formation is more dense than below. Before exiting the canyon, however, there is one more layer to scale, the Kaibab formation. The Kaibab's limestone cliffs are full of marine fossils that tell us about life here 270 million years ago. Let me trade the pictures first. I'll read the bottom too. When, rock, when rocks break apart, it's called weathering. When the broken pieces are carried away, it's called erosion. Ice and growing plants break up rocks in Grand Canyon. And most of the sediment is removed from the canyon by water. So look at this picture of the tree. Little bitty tree. Tree and ice, tree's getting bigger, tree is big at the end. Okay. Grand Canyon's walls have both cliffs and slopes because different layers erode in different ways. Sandstone and limestone tend to break off in blocks, leaving cliffs. Shale and mudstone tend to crumble and form slopes. 
often shell erodes beneath limestone or sandstone and the cliff wall gives way. So this explains one of those pictures where we had all the rocks that were crumbling. We saw that in one of our photos. Um, I think it was picture number one in our modern day photos, how the rocks were all crumbling. Okay, the Kaibab's limestone, limestone walls are full of marine fossils that tell us about life here 270 million years ago. So <laughs> must be weird looking to see in the desert fossils of sea creatures like this little boy is discovering. When the ocean again covered the land, fossils in the Kaibab form formation tell of a complex ecosystem. The sea floor was home to sea lilies and brazoans, sponges and coral. Trilobites and brachiopods lived alongside them, while nautiloids and as many as 40 species of shark patrolled the water above them. Many of these creatures, such as coral and brachiopods, had hard shells. When they died, their shells piled up on the seafloor and eventually transformed into the limestone of the Kaibab formation. So we have another ocean layer. It's hard to imagine that the Grand Canyon was ocean so many times in its history. Okay. How did the environment change from the Coconino sandstone layer formed? Coconino sandstorm, sandstone. So I gotta go back to the Coconino. So here's the Coconino sandstone, this layer to the Kaibab formation. How did the environment change? And I have to remind you again, how do we know the environment changed? It's not just because Jason Chin got someone to draw these beautiful, or paint these beautiful pictures. How do we know the environment changed? What's our proof? And then we go to the other question of how did the environment change? What animals lived in the Coconino sandstone uh, formation? And then what animals lived in the Kaibab formation? Okay, as a reminder, this is Kaibab. Not the human. The human is there for interest in the story. And then Coconino. Okay. We're almost done, kids. If you ascend, which means to go up, from the Colorado River to the south rim of Grand Canyon, you will have climbed nearly five thousand feet up and passed through three distinct habitats. Above the rim, you'll find one more. The Ponderosa Pine Forest is home to tassel-eared squirrels. That guy, in other words, poof balls on the top of his ears, different from what we have here. Deer and elk, bobcats, coyotes, and hawks hunt here, as well as the top predators in the canyon, mountain lions. Ken uh, has all these fantastic illustrations all around the page. Okay.
Because of its great size and depth, Grand Canyon has a wide range of climates and habitats, and species that call the canyon home today survive on ancient rocks. Rocks that tell us about life here long before there was a canyon. The grandest canyon on earth. Jason Chin is an amazing illustrator. So on the other page, there's more writing. It's taken millions of years of weathering and erosion to expose these rocks and shape this breathtaking landscape. And these processes continue to this day, relentlessly excavating the grandest canyon on earth. Okay. How does the environment of the Grand Canyon today influence what organisms can be found there. So we just read that there are currently, you go through three habitats in the Grand Canyon now, and then there's one more. So there's four different habitats currently at the Grand Canyon. We're not talking about the past, we're talking about now, 2020. There are four habitats, okay? How does the environment today affect what lives there? Would a shark live in the Grand Canyon today? How about a polar bear? Why or why not? How does the environment affect what lives there? So in your log book, which is your science book that we do everything in, on page 13, I want you to draw or describe how the environment of the Grand Canyon has changed over time. Okay. Um, in your words, you can describe multiple changes. In your box, you can describe multiple changes. This book was kind of like a storybook version of our chart that we made of layers A through F, right? It talks about the Grand Canyon being ocean, then land, well, actually, mud flats, then, um, was it mud flats, then, we'll come back to the mud flats, guys. First, we had mud flats, then, ocean, then, So mud flats, then ocean, then land with moist areas, then dry land, then more ocean, then dry land that it is now. So I want you to draw how the Grand Canyon has changed over time in the box. Okay. And then I want you to describe how it has changed over time. Okay. What I'm looking for, honestly, more than the drawing is your description but I know for some people it's easier for them to draw than to write. 
So for my students who find it easier to draw, this is your time to shine. I need to see the different periods of time of the Grand Canyon. Okay, depict the different periods of time of the Grand Canyon. I just read the book. I know you don't have the book with you, but you can go backwards in the Zoom video because pre recorded. You also can go backwards in your notebook and pull that information from your chart. Okay, so draw it, describe it in words. Okay, then in class, we are going to go through and revise our anchor model. I'm obviously not in class. I'm at home. That's my son's cozy blanket behind me. He used to belong to the middle son, who's now 20. It tells you that blanket's kind of old behind me. So I cannot revise my anchor models in my classroom if I'm at home, okay? So what I can tell you are the words that describe um, what would be added to it and I can show you the picture that's in my teacher manual, okay? Because I'm trying to get you ready for conceptual checkpoint. Then I'm gonna read out to you the question from the checkpoint. I'm gonna give you a complete answer for checkpoint. And then you can go off and actually take your checkpoint, okay? So going back to our concept one focus question, what do Earth's rock layers reveal? Um, I'll be starting an anchor chart because we don't have enough chart papers in our room yet. We've got to plaster some more big pieces of paper in the classroom. What do our rock layers reveal? So fossils and rock layers reveal a lot about Earth. They reveal what the different environmental conditions were in the Earth over time. So, so Fossils show that an environment keeps changing. They show different plants and animals live in the different environments. Just like when each of my students today or yesterday in class were assigned a layer of rock to press a fossil into, each layer represented a time period and then we sandwiched them together so that we had a representative of the Grand Canyon, layer F, then E, then D, then C, then B, then A, with all their smashed in fossils, fossil impressions. Um, those fossils told us what each layer, layer's environment had been, okay? Some layers of the Grand Canyon have fossils of ocean animals. So we know that part of Earth was underwater when those layers were formed. Other layers have fossils of both land animals and plants. So those areas must have been land when those animals and plants lived. I hope that makes sense. Older fossils are found in lower layers because lower layers are older, just like the cake we looked at yesterday. The bottom layers of the cake are the oldest. They're put down first. In the Grand Canyon, the bottom layers of the Grand Canyon are older. The top layers of the Grand Canyon are younger. So younger fossils are found in upper layers. And as the earth is aged, more and more complex organisms have evolved. So when layer E of Grand Canyon was being laid down, the organisms were simpler. They weren't as complex as say layer A and B. The organisms are more like today's organisms, um, closer to what walks around the earth or you know plants of earth today, more complex. Okay. So fossils and rock layers provide evidence of past environments, revealing changes over time. The oldest layers are at the bottom and the youngest layers are at the top. Okay. Then looking at 
the picture that I'm going to show you in a minute, which features the Grand Canyon have we described? We've looked at the Grand Canyon's layers. We've looked at the Grand Canyon's rock layers, and we know that it has fossils of different plants and animals. So here's an intriguing question. Do you think there was always a canyon on this part of Earth's surface? Think about that for a minute. Has there always been the Grand Canyon? Think about my video from yesterday. You had when the Earth was created and then when the Grand Canyon started, layer F. Was the Grand Canyon there when the Earth started or was there a time before the Grand Canyon? What do you think carved the canyon? Because you had rock first. I showed you that in the pictures in the book today. You had rock and then something carved down the rock. Remember that little picture? What carved the rock? So here is a sample picture from the book. Okay. Shows a river. It shows a big rock. It shows smaller rocks. It shows a cave. Um, let me turn around real quick. Black rock, striped walls. They want me to add in fossils. Okay, so it says striped walls, has waterfall, river. So they want me to have the river in there. They want the wall striped, so I have to have layers in there. And they want fossils there. So the rock walls of the Grand Canyon have different colored stripes. Fossils of animals and plants that are found in the layers we see tell us about the fat past landscapes of the area that's now the Grand Canyon. In the past, the area was covered with ocean waters, tropical waters, which just means warm ocean waters, and land, both swampy and dry. There is a river at the bottom of the canyon, and that's an important point. The river is at the bottom. Why? What does that tell you? That's important. Okay, now we're to the conceptual checkpoint. Now you're going to use your new knowledge to explain how the landscape of a different area of the United States changed over time by completing a conceptual checkpoint. Um, here is, good thing I have two arms. Here's the picture. Okay. To build a new subway system, construction workers cut through a section of rock and uncovered several rock layers. The construction workers noticed different types of fossils in each layer. The model below shows where these fossils were found. Using evidence from the model, identify the order in which the rock layers formed and explain how the landscape of this area has changed over time. Okay, this is what I'm expecting to hear. You have to tell me what is the oldest layer, what is the newest layer. You have to tell me what those fossils indicate also. So an exemplar means a perfect example, okay? I'm going to read to you a perfect answer, one that would get you a five out of five, which means 100% A. Let me go back, five out of five. This is not worth a lot of points, okay? Not worth as much as your daily classwork assignments are. Layer one, the newest layer. Look at the picture. Layer one's the one on top. Remember, we've been talking about layer on top is newest. Layer one, the newest layer, was a dry land area because it had conifers. See where it says it there? 
dysonodonts, lungfish, and conifer fossils. Layer one, the newest layer was a dry land area because it had conifers. And we know it had fresh water, such as rivers and lakes, because it had lungfish. Layer two had ferns and mammal-like reptiles, so we know it had dry land. Layer two also had winged insects, which like moist environments. Layer three, which we know is the oldest layer since it's on the bottom, was once covered by ocean because brachiopods, corals, and mollusks only live in the ocean. Notice I pointed out what's the oldest layer, what's the newest layer. I pointed out how we know it's the oldest and how we know it's newest. I'd listed out specific fossils in each layer. And I said how I know what the environment was based upon the fossils in that layer. All of that is expected and they have to be complete sentences in order to get your full five out of five. Okay. You have to write that here. You might have to write small to make it all fit. Minimum three sentences. One sentence about layer one, one sentence about layer two, one sentence about layer three. You have to tell me what's the oldest layer, what's the youngest layer, how you know that, what those fossils tell you about the environment when each layer was laid down. Okay? That's how you make your five out of five. So today's assignments, conceptual checkpoint, five points. Changes in the Grand Canyon over time, okay? This will be worth five points also. Drawing the words. Tell me how the Grand Canyon changed over time, okay? And guys, your checkpoint, you can use all the information that you have in your book so far. It's open book. So I do hope that you've been keeping up and doing all these assignments and the work that I've posted on class dojo, the examples of the notice and wonder boards that we did as a class, the examples of the class anchor chart, the class, I'm sorry, the class anchor model. Um, those are hanging up in class. If you were in my class, you would be looking at them when you're taking the quiz flip through class dojo and look at those images while you're taking the quiz. You have all of that there to help you. Okay. Your science is due Friday. Tuesday we move into social studies. Okay. And Ms. Ramitas and I are going to be contacting every virtual child in the coming few, next few days because everybody has to do a testing, um, protocol called ice deep testing in the next week. So we'll be contacting all of our kiddos next few days. Okay. Sorry, this is a long lesson. It just is. Um, PhD, like I've said before, it has a lot of information to it. It's rigorous. It's not easy. Hope you guys have a good evening. Good seeing you guys again. Bye.